and welcome to this episode of Create a Life You Love with Tony G. I am beyond honored today. I have Dr. John Yosef on my show today, and this is going to be such an eye-opening interview. Dr. John Yosef is, um, well, I wrote it down just so I would not forget because I'm so honored to have him on and just a little bit nervous. <laughs> Dr. John Yosef is a world-renowned plastic surgeon with national awards as well as patients from around the world. He's a leader in discovery in new procedures and has more than 20 years, more than 20 years of research on facial aging and facial reconstruction. Hi, Dr. Yosef. Welcome Hello. to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure. It's absolutely my honor. Trust Thank me you. on this Thank one. You. So the first question I ask every guest is, when did you know you wanted to be in the medical field? What started you down this road? Uh, you know, it's a funny thing is that I've always, uh, as long as I can remember, wanted to be in medicine. And maybe it was my mother who drilled that into me, but, uh, <laughs> you know, she... Um, I don't know if it was that, but I was always interested in anatomy and uh, kind of always knew I was going to do medicine. Right. And so that was, I don't think there was a real question about, I didn't really want to be a fireman. It was always wanting to go into medicine. Okay. And maybe, as I said, maybe that was my mother, but that's where it went. Well, thank goodness for her, no, right? Yeah, right. <laughs> yes. And when did you know you wanted to take that into plastic and reconstructive and work in that area? What was the... Well, um... That's an interesting, I, I, I kind of always knew I liked surgery. I was very technically oriented and detail oriented. And um, I was always the artsy person in medical school. So my friends thought I should do plastic surgery. And it, it, so it just so happened I was in Connecticut doing general surgery. I, I liked surgery. And then my friend was here at the Medical College of Wisconsin and said, well, he was, um, he was rotating through the plastic surgery department and said that they did all these great new things and I should come and interview. And so I came out here and they were doing new things in microsurgery and microsurgical reconstruction and uh, hand surgery and all this. And it really, that technical detail really interested me. And so I applied and I was out here. And I did my residency out here and then stayed on to do a hand and micro fellowship. And then they asked me to stay on and teach plastic surgery. So I, after that, I joined the faculty and then, um, you know, for some reason, um, as I did different things, when you're in the academic field, you're publishing about things. And, and I had published about different hand issues and breast reconstruction. And as w I was progressing, it came to facial aging because I didn't really agree with what, was, what people were saying. And so I thought I'd go into that field. And, and that kind of starts your clinical practice when you're publishing about that. We won a national award about a uh, paper in the early 90s about facial aging and what was happening with the face over time. And then it kind of started me interested in, interesting enough started me in, to be interested in, um, you know, if I know how it ages, how can I put it back together so it looks natural if, if I was doing a cosmetic procedure such as facial reconstruction or facial rejuvenation. And then I started on publishing that about how to do what I call my mid-face lift. And then recently in December of last year, I published my, my technique for neck lifts. And um, so it just kind of goes on from there. Yeah, and one thing that I know is recently you were invited to speak and teach in two very prominent uh, locations for two very prominent uh, uh, sets of people. I would like you to explain a little bit about that because that's quite a coup. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it was yes. actually, I, was, um, I got an email and I was going to delete it, but it was from a person in Russia yeah. and said he'd like, he's read my paper on the neck lift and like me to come and give that discussion. And uh, it was in St. Petersburg, Russia. And uh, amazing city and great people, and the conference was great. And so there were a lot of international speakers from around the world. And we were giving talks on the face and facial aging. And I gave my talks on different aspects of facial aging and my neck lift. And uh, then 
After that, I was invited to go speak at the Israeli National Conference. Wow. So invited to go to Tel Aviv and spent some time there and gave talks on what we, well, our experience in microsurgery that was beyond just facial aging and as well as facial aging and um, just great travel. It was wonderful. Both places were beautiful. How amazing. What incredible experiences, it right? Is, yeah, Such a beautiful, great. to be able to visit those places, but then to be able to teach what you're so passionate about at the same time. It's wonderful. And you know what? You learn a lot from those places. I mean, you learn from other lecturers and you learn from people that you're teaching. And so it's always a great experience. Absolutely. Now, I, I need to ask you, what's the difference between plastic surgery and reconstructive surgery? Let's get that out of the way right. before we start talking right. about right. the face and what we can do with it. Well, you know, the term plastics comes from the Greek term plastico, which means to mold or to change. And so it's all plastic surgery, but there is a distinction between cosmetic surgery and reconstructive surgery. And cosmetic surgery uh, is the change of something that's already normal, that's there, uh, and doesn't really need to be changed per se. Uh, and reconstructive surgery is building things back up, um, a, a traumatic injury, something that is a functional problem. And so there is a difference between cosmetic surgery and reconstructive surgery, and, and we do both. Most plastic surgeons do both things. Um, and I think that it's surprising. This is one, one reason I really like plastic surgery is because you can do all different kinds of areas in the body. You could do, you know, a hand surgery one day and then another day you could be doing a facelift or a facial surgery or a facial reconstruction or breast reconstruction. So it leaves a lot of area of interest for you to kind of explore uh, on a professional sense. Um, so, yeah, plastic surgeons are, are not just cosmetic surgeons, so okay. keep that in mind. So today, you and I are going to be focusing on facial surgery and all the way down to the neck, but you will be on again, and during those episodes, we'll discuss um, breast augmentations and, I can move my hand, <laughs> <laughs> and body reconstruction, so on and so forth. But today, we're gonna focus on the face. So my first question to you is, I've seen people who have had, they've been over, surgery i'm sure you've seen the specials with the the couple called they're not actually an actual couple but barbie and ken sure <laughs> and they're trying to look exactly like these dolls and they've had so much surgery you can look at them and you know but sometimes when you look at the average person you can see somebody's had some work done and it doesn't look quite right so what would you say to that yeah, I mean, like I can, I can see it, right, 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 I can see yeah. it myself, I mean, I, I, you know, you can kind of point those people out, and I think that it's, it's hard on the public to understand what's going on, because they think that you can go to one person, and they're going to do a facelift, or go to another person, and they're going to do a facelift, and those two facelifts may be totally different, and it's, um, it's surprising to understand how many face lift procedures there are. Because underneath the incisions, and even the incisions can be different. I've seen bad scars in bad places that aren't well done. Um, but then after the incision, you have all these structures in, in the face, and uh, the surgeon, or you know, he or she may have been trained one way or, or really not understand facial surgery, surgery because it's hard, the, the face is difficult. A lot of important structures there, but they can be doing different things, and those different things that someone pulls on or changes that position make make the final result look good or look abnormal. And it's not really just looking tight. That's not the the point of a facial surgery. Right. Looking good, looking natural, looking like yourself is really the point of facial surgery. And that's why I started studying this. Why is it that some surgeries look good and others don't? And I think that. You know, from a publication that I did early on in the early 90s, you, you, if you understand where things are going with time, then if you, you put them back into that right position, it's just logical that if you put the structures back into the right position, that someone will look natural. If you put them out of position, the, the observer may not know why that doesn't look right, but they know it doesn't look right. Exactly. That makes so much sense. Now, when somebody comes into your office and maybe... I know um, 
first and foremost, I think um, most people that know me know I love Botox. <laughs> I love fillers, even though I haven't had it in a while. Um, and I agree that if somebody wants to feel better about themselves, we feel so young on the inside. And we, wanna, we want that to be uh, apparent on our outside, too. We want to look as young as we feel. We want to look vibrant and healthy and happy and, um, and match the, the way we feel on the inside to the outside. And when someone comes in your office, do you, I know you also, you do the fillers and you do the surgeries. So do you often uh, recommend one way over the other for patients? And what's that deciding factor? Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, you see a patient and you certainly want to discuss the things that are bothering them the most. And I think mm -hmm. you can focus on those areas. And I, I think that's the, that's the good thing about going to a plastic surgeon to do even the other things, the injections, the Botox, the filler, because um, if I only have Botox and filler as my tool, then that's all I'm gonna offer you. Right. But if I understand that, listen, I have Botox, I have filler, I have r facial resurfacing, I have all these things, but I also have surgery. And I, I, will, I want, and I tell all my patients, I wanna be your physician, I don't wanna be your salesperson. I want to tell you what's right for you and when it's right for you. And if I don't think something's right or it's a timing for that, then I'll tell you. And I'll guide you through that process so that it doesn't look badly done. Um, but I think certainly my goal is to do the least to get the patient where they want to be. And sometimes they, the patients don't totally understand, well, what direction do I need to go? This is what I want. Uh, they come in and say, well, I want filler. And I tell them, you know, that much filler to correct that particular issue, you'd be better off having the surgery. Right. Or someone comes in and says, well, I want surgery. And I say, you know, you can achieve that with just some little filler. You don't, you're really not ready for surgery yet. So you have to have someone that you trust that you're going to go down a journey with. I have patients who have come and they say, oh, you know, I had Botox here and I had Bo and filler there and a different person did this. And, did. and I think that's hard because you know, a good clinician is going to learn from some issues. If I, if I didn't get the Botox in the right place the first time, well, come back and see me so I can correct it and I can, we can learn together and go down this road together. Right. I think that's really important. I agree. And, it, you know, having had some of these, you know, the fillers, because I have this very, very, um, I have some Native American in me, so my skin tends to do that Native American thing, and my upper lip t tended to get very thin. And I love the lip injection for that, and going to the right person for these procedures is more important than the procedure themselves. And you have Sierra Spa. Yes. Where you do some of these procedures, the fillers, and you also work out of a hospital for the surgeries. Yes. Correct. And the amount of research that you've spent, the amount of time you've spent researching this, I mean, you've done 20 years of research on what works and what doesn't. And if there's, if there's one thing that's important to somebody who's looking at making sure their face is done right, <laughs> right, <laughs> that should be it. That should be the deciding factor right there. Somebody who's put, who's that passionate and has put that time and effort. Now, I do know you brought some before and after photos that you would like to share, and I would love to see these photos because I, I was able to look through them quickly um, in the beginning, and I'm so excited to hear the stories behind them and what you, like some of the work that you did to them so that we can see the difference it makes just a little bit go such a far way and how natural they look. Well, you know, we can, you know, and as you said, we'll, we can talk about a lot of things over different sessions, but certainly, you know, facial surgery is not easy. And someone who just does an occasional facelift and doesn't study it and understand it is not gonna have a great result, but, um, I think understanding the facial anatomy and understanding you know, the procedures, the right procedures to do with each individual is so important. Uh, this first photograph is from a paper that I did in the early 90s. Uh, actually, it was a research paper and won one of the national awards. And what we did 
it was a huge paper. We had anatomic dissections and histological dissections, and part of it was to take photographs of individuals in different decades and to see what was happening uh, in their structures and we uh, facial structure. We digitized the photographs, and if you go to the next photograph, um, you see that this is kind of what's happening, um, and you can see this person as she's aged, and that central structure, that mid face, uh, that cheek pad tends to drop down with time, and as it drops away, and drops, I think, because of gravity, it tends to become lower, and it tends to widen the face in the, in the lower part of the face, but also tends to have the lower lids look longer. I, if, I'm, yes. if I'm seeing someone's face, or if they've had facial surgery, I look at their lower lids, because if it's done well, the lower lids look short again, the way she had her lower lids when she was younger, and that's a good surgery. Um, so, um, and that's what, you know, if you bring those structures back to the right position, then they, then they look more natural. Awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Um, I have some, some examples of that. So at the I time, I, I um, you can go even to the first patient photograph. There we go. Uh, and you can see that that's what happens with time is that the structures go down, the lower lids look longer, and the lower part of the face looks wider. And, um, you know, the face is, the, the lips are hold, held up by muscles. And I did, I just a photograph I had painted, but the lips are basically held up by muscles while the soft tissue on either side of the lips, that's the nasolabial fold that's being held up in position. And the soft tissue, the cheek pad, is dropping down over time. So that's what happens. We, you know. Um, right. Right. We can go to number eight. Yeah, and that's a patient. So that's a patient with a mid face lift and a face lift. And you can see her, her cheek pads are brought up back to where they were when she was younger, and her lower lids look shorter. I think that's a natural looking face that's, lift. That's amazing. The difference in that photo. It, it what's what I love about that photo is as you look at the the one side, the, the face looks a little wider on the bottom, and then after the procedure. It goes back to that like heart shaped right, bottom, right, if right. you will. Right, without without adding something or subtracting right. something, just bringing the structures back to where they were. How beautiful is Thank that? Thank you. Yeah, that's she such looks a great. beautiful. And, and you would never. You and don't I don't think you'd her. know from this after photograph that she had a facial no, surgery done. I would not look at her and say she looks like she's had procedures done. I would say on the on the one side she looks tired and like she is overworked, but on the other side, she looks refreshed and natural. Right. You can, you can look at number 11, and okay. you can see that. So that's another that's that patient we saw before. Her cheeks are back up into position. Uh, her neck is done, of course, all those other things. But if you go to the next photograph, this is two years out. Um, there she is. Uh, that's her after surgery, but that was her in her 30s. And I think if you puff up her hair and put it in black and white, that I, I think she looks close to what she looked like in her 30s without looking like, you know, she's had a surgical procedure. Yeah, and, she, then, and again, very natural. It's her, just younger. Right, and then the next photograph. Oh, wow. Now that patient had a surgery seven years prior to that time and then she came to see me. Uh, so she had it somewhere else and came to see me. Without having had a mid-face lift, you can see that it didn't really change her facial structure that first surgery. And then bringing the structures back into position made her eyes look better, made her, her lower part of her face look better, made her mid-face look more youthful. Right. And you can go to the next one, you can see where the eyes are different. I think it oh, makes a real difference. Yes. Yes. And the cheeks. Right. I mean, that line, we get that pronounced line from the, the edge of our nose down right. to Right. That's called the nasolabial fold. Yeah. Right. And then, it, it, but in... After the procedure, that is so softened, if not gone. Right. So basically, I mean, that's, you know, I think that, you know, understanding what to do for the patient is really important. Not everyone needs that. There's sometimes you don't need to do a mid face lift. You don't need to, you know, you need something smaller. You need something just in the office. You can just do fillers. Sometimes you can get fillers to help reformat the mid face if it's not too low. If it's too low, then it's going to be very difficult. And I think 
you've seen some people who've had too much filler to try to correct a problem that shouldn't be corrected with filler. Right. And you know, you've got to be able to walk that line, I think. There is a line between what you can do and what you want to, you know, what you do to make someone look natural. And I think it's really important to work with a doctor who offers a little bit of everything so that they're not just pushing you or trying to guide you in this one direction that might not be appropriate for you. They're open to doing, let's do this or this or this and a little bit of that. Right. Meaning if you need a little procedure, you, we can do a little bit of a procedure, but if, you, if, if a filler is going to work, let's start there and save it that procedure for later on in time. A absolutely. I, I, think you, I think if you can get away, if, I think if you can look natural with things that are done in the office, pro certainly protecting your skin with sunscreen yes. and, uh, and, and whatever that is, um, I think the less you do, you know, as you start off, you know, if you can get a natural look with a filler, I, I always start there or start with Botox or whatever that is. And then we go on potentially um, what doesn't look right is if someone keeps trying to correct a descent issue with fill issue. And nowadays, a lot of people are doing fat injections into the face. And um, even in New York, there's some people talking about that's all they do is fat injections. Well, that doesn't seem to make sense because, you know, you didn't lose all the fat in your face. And so I'm, I'm going to just put it back. That's not facial aging. Just It's not all about... Right fat loss, but you can fill the face up to look tight, but that's not looking natural. Exactly. And so uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of each thing, a little bit of fat injections, a little bit of a lift, maybe a mid face lift, whatever it is to, to make someone look appropriate. Absolutely. And I love that philosophy. I love that you are looking at the face and seeing what the person needs and working within those parameters for that person. And every single person is different. Let's move on to some of the procedures sure. that you do. I'm very excited sure. to talk about this. So um, first of all, let's talk about the lip augmentation. So what, first explain, what is a lip augmentation and what, what, what does that entail? Well, I, I do think we lose some volume in the lips uh, with time and with age. And um, I, I, you know, um, we started off trying to put collagen back into the lips, and it was all kinds of products. We even started off with bovine or bovine collagen. We have to test the patients to see if they were allergic to it. And but nowadays, um, most of the lip injection is done with something called hyaluronic acid, and it's a product that's in our body, and somehow either the company extracts it or they make it chemically and then they put it in a, a medium, some type, of, uh, some type of, of either sphere or whatever that they collect the hyaluronic acid. And that's usually what's injected into the lips. And there are different products and they have different connections to each other. So some are softer, some are, um, some are more fluid, some are uh, whatever those products are. But most often we're injecting some kind of product with hyaluronic acid in it. Um, the problem is that, and I think a lot of people have seen this, and I get this all the time when I tell my patients that, um, you know, you might consider a little bit of lip injection, it scares them because they've seen some really bad lip injections. Um, and, you know, it's not fair sometimes to compare someone's bad lip injections. The, the good lip injections you may not notice on the street. Um, exactly. So. You know, if it's done correctly, um, and if you understand the anatomy, then I think, you know, a small amount or a moderate amount, depending on where each patient goes. I, I like to do it in stages. You do a small amount first, um, you know, see if the patient likes that. Um, and it's certainly important to understand the anatomy so that you have a distinction of the lip itself, the red part, the, you know, looking at that person's anatomy. Um, and then do it slowly. So you do a small injection first and see if the patient likes it. And sometimes they want a little bit more. I've had patients come back and say, I like this. I, I, <clears throat> a lot of times they'll, they'll go away a little swollen. They'll be a little worried. But most of the time that comes back down uh, to an appropriate, you know, if you're careful, it comes down to what looks nice on that patient. And then if they want to come back, they can come back and have a little bit more done. 
uh, to the point, and I'm there to kind of limit them and say, well, you know, okay, you know, you can have a little bit more done, it will still look natural, or to tell them, you know, I think you, we should wait a little bit more, because if we do a little bit more, it might not look so good. That's nice. Uh, right, that's, yeah. That's good that you're there to guide them yeah. that way, because once it's in, it lasts for quite a bit of time, and you would rather have them come back and get a little bit more than regret having overdone right. it and maybe never do it again or think that it was a bad um, right. experience. Yeah. That's really yeah. The, the funny thing is I see the, the bad injections tend to last longer than the good injections. <laughs> I don't know what, the, what that is. But most, most lip injections will last for about a year or a year yeah. and a half. Uh, the good thing is you can always inject it away. So hyaluronic acid has something called hyaluronidase, which if you really didn't like it, you could inject it away. Uh, but, but that's really rare to do. Um, uh, most of the time, if you do it correctly, it looks nice. Um, Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So, um, Dr. Yosef, there's so much more I want to talk with you about and so many more procedures that you do that I would love to uh, discuss with you. Now, we only have about two minutes left, so what I would like you first and foremost to do is tell people if they want to connect with you, if they have some questions, if they want to come in for a consultation, how do they get a hold of you? Um, well, you can certainly call my office, uh, and that's 414-352-2766. You can go on my website, drjohnyusuf.com, and there's an email section. You can email questions. But I think that's really important to go on and to look at an individual surgeon's website. And, and you know, this is an elective. If you're really considering a surgery, it's elective. Go talk to the person. Make sure you get a good feeling about how they are looking at you as a patient versus as a customer, and I think that's really important. Absolutely, and having, it, and I, I'm not afraid to admit this, having had you work on me already, um, you've done some filler around my eye in the past. This isn't recent, folks. Don't judge it by now. <laughs> um, you're very gentle and kind, and when somebody is in your office, they are your priority, and I feel like that is the most important thing, and you're never pushing it. You're not Here's the way I'll say it. You're never selling a product. You simply want to help the canvas of the person who's sitting in front of you. Yeah, exactly. And I that's think that's a, really important. It you're, is. you're the physician for that person. You have to guide them through things. Absolutely. You have to be their advocate. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. That's my mother talking, you see. You have see. to be kind. <laughs> <laughs> well, she must, uh, she must be a very good woman because she, uh, Thank you. she, she taught you very well. Thank you. So if there's one last thing with like maybe a 30 seconds of what you would like to say of why someone should come to you or something you would like to add that you did. Well, you know, I think, you, you know, I'd be happy to, to talk to anyone and come and uh, come on in and let's talk about your face and talk about the issues and, you know, get an honest, objective opinion. You know, the other thing is to take care of your skin. You know, sunscreen is the thing that I tell everybody about. A broad spectrum sunscreen um, is... Uh, really important just for skin cancers and for protecting from fine lines and so broad spectrum sunscreens usually um, you know I'd like them to be not incorporated in the cosmetic but at least that if not you know even in the winter we get a fair amount of sun in Wisconsin so protect your skin absolutely I agree I absolutely agree and what we put in our body is just as important as what we uh, put on our body I would like to thank you for joining us for well, this episode of Create a Life You Love. And Dr. Yosef, thank you so much. I'm looking so forward to the next episode. <laughs> thank you, Tony. I had a great time. I appreciate it. It's a lot of fun. I appreciate your time and your effort in putting this together. Oh, thank you. Thank and you. And we look forward to the next episode. Have an amazing day. Thank you. Thank you.